We now return to Monday's hearing on the Waco investigation. Last week, a House Joint Subcommittee began eight days of hearings into events in Waco, Texas in the spring of 1993. Witnesses include officials of the alcohol, tobacco, and firearms, and Treasury Departments. The uh, Joint Subcommittees on the Waco matter are reconvened. The hearing is reconvened. If we could get some order in the House, as they say, or order in the committee meeting room. We're back aboard at this point. When we uh, recessed a few minutes ago, we recessed for lunch under an understanding that we would have uh, the reservation of time. But Ms. Thurman and I each had five minutes on the first round and only real round of questions we have for this panel. But because we had quite a number of other questions to uh, ask that we hadn't hadn't gotten to that we thought were very important. We had gotten by unanimous consent permission for each of us to control in addition to those five minutes, uh, 15 minutes each on our side to conclude the questions of this panel. And with that in mind, then I'm going to yield myself at this point such time of, of my time as I may consume. And I'm going to ask the first question I have to Mr. Altman, who has a plane to catch. And I'm going to go to Mr. Zella for an Altman question as well. And anybody on your side, Ms. Thurman, who wants to, so we can let him go. He's been very good to be down here on an extra day. Mr. Altman, uh, I understand from testimony last week that you did not know at any time before this raid on February 28th occurred uh, anything about it, its planning or the fact it was going to happen or anything else about it. But we need for you to say for the record whether you did or not. Well, that's <coughs> largely true, Mr. Chairman. <coughs> uh, but on the Friday evening before the Sunday raid, uh, I was called. I think I'd left the office already, but I was called by my then special assistant, who told me simply that there would be a major ATF uh, activity over the weekend, that it might uh, generate some press, and that uh, if I saw the press, not to be surprised. I wasn't asked for my approval. I wasn't told Waco or Branch Davidians or anything to that effect. Uh, I, I was told only what I just told you. And you did not inquire and, and learn any more at that point? I didn't. When did you first learn of this raid? Apart from what I just related? Yes. Uh, I learned on the Sunday morning, uh, sometime around 11, I think it was, but I'm not certain, uh, when Ron Noble called me at home in New York uh, and informed me what had happened. Mr. Altman, uh, before the, the raid on February 25th, Mr. Higgins testified, the director of ATF last week, that he had not met you, had not even personally shaken hands with you. Could you tell us if that comports with your recollection? Uh, did you at any time prior to the 28th of February, 1993, uh, have a meeting or meet with Mr. Higgins? Well, I had a practice of having uh, biweekly meetings of all the bureau heads, which includes ATF. And the first one of those meetings would have occurred uh, before the raid because we'd been in office a few weeks. Uh, I don't recall whether Mr. Higgins attended it. Perhaps he didn't. Uh, and I wouldn't have, in any event have had any one-on-one -on -one discussions with him. Uh, those were meetings where one typically went around the room and asked for highlights of activities or planned activities. But in any event, you don't recall specifically whether Mr. Higgins was in attendance at that meeting or not, if there was one, and that you do not recall any specific discussions you had with Mr. Higgins uh, before February 28th, or actually meeting him personally? Uh, no, sir, I don't. Thank you. Now, Mr. Zellup, I'm going to yield to you so we can have you ask Mr. Altman any questions you Mr. have. Mr. Altman, uh, I've read your letter over and over and over again over this weekend, and I want to congratulate you for your gut, as you described it, your gut instinct that something really bad was going to happen um, after your briefing and that you felt that uh, your boss, Mr. Benson, should be notified. And uh, it, it just seems to me that, that with we're in government here, you know, when we know of things that are going to happen, somebody has to step up and be responsible, and you, you did do that. I guess my concern would be is once you did this on April 15th, uh, did you follow up in, in between 15th and the 19th and talking with Secretary Benson? You probably talked to him about 10, 15, 20 other things. Is this one of the things on the to-do list that you might have said, well, did you get my letter? Well, Mr. Zeloff, as I said earlier, I don't remember whether I 
actually had any oral discussion with Secretary Benson on this, or whether I didn't, because we did have such a large amount of, of uh, business between us. But I did not seek uh, to press the point, uh, mostly because I felt completely unqualified to make that judgment. It was my instinct, and I reflected it to Secretary Benson because that was the type of relationship I had with him. But uh, uh, I, I, I didn't have any basis from which to push the point. Uh, you'll note that in that letter I said that it was also my hunch that if uh, the FBI <coughs> simply waited out Mr. Koresh, then probably he would concede. And having listened to some testimony this morning, Mr. Rodriguez, he's pretty persuasive to the effect that that particular hunch would have been wrong. I guess, I guess my concern is, is if I was just walking to the market and I saw somebody setting a fire, um, I'd probably see that the proper authorities were notified and I'd probably stick around to make sure that I've done everything I can possibly do. But, but again, I congratulate you for having the instincts to, that you knew something bad was going to happen. You, you at least put it on a piece of paper and, and sent it in. Thank you. Uh, I have one question for Mrs. Wheeler. Um, you were the publicity person for ATF and you testified that you made in, informal or informational telephone calls when, to radio and TV stations. <coughs> I guess my question is, and, and, and maybe you can help me, um, you were brought down there to do publicity, or your job was to do publicity, and the word that we heard somewhere along the line is the nickname or the code name of this operation was Showtime. Could you add something to that? And, and did that have anything to do with your uh, arranging publicity or having the TV stations available? Or not, sir. First of all, I contacted no radio stations. Uh, second of all, Showtime was strictly a word that was going to be used when to alert everyone that the agents had stepped off the trucks. It was not the name of the operation. It never was the name of the operation. Showtime was strictly a word used so that it was a word used that people don't use in regular conversation on a daily basis. They said if they chose that word, when showtime was said, that meant that everybody knew that the agents had stepped off the truck. And that was all showtime meant. Well, <clears throat> I, I just have to, and I'll turn my, turn my time back to the chairman, but uh, it just seems to me that it's a poor use of words in terms of showtime, uh, in terms of calling those TV stations, uh, in terms of staging a publicity event that was about to happen to be successful, but unfortunately it was not successful. And I just think the word showtime ended up getting echoed, um, probably a bad, bad choice of words to use. It may have been a bad choice. Ms. Thurmond, I understand there may be a question of Mr. Altman on your side. And if there is, we need to uh, get that out so we can leave. And I will at this time yield one minute to uh, Mr. Scott from Virginia. Thank you. Um, I thank the lady from Florida. Just a couple of questions, Mr. Altman. <coughs> Put the uh, Waco situation in context. Uh, when was the um, New York City World Trade Center bombing in relationship to these events? I believe it was the <coughs> Friday uh, before the uh, initial ATF raid on that Sunday. And were you involved, was the uh, Treasury Department involved in that investigation? It, well, the, the Treasury Department was immediately involved, uh, although I wasn't particularly so personally, immediately okay, well, involved. Let me ask another question because I'm going to try to get this in a minute. Where was Secretary Benston during this time? Secretary Benson was in London attending a G7 finance ministers meeting on Were that Were you Friday. involved in that? Uh, no, I was home uh, mining the store, so to speak. And so you had the World Trade Center, you had the uh, international uh, monetary situation, and after April 15th, what was Treasury's, ra Treasury's role at Waco? After April 15th? Right, the, this memo that they keep waving around is April 15th. On and after April 15th, what was Treasury's role? Well, Treasury's role was largely limited, I believe, to preparations to conduct the investigation about the original February raid. But nothing, af nothing at Waco. You had been taken out of the uh, situation. Well, the FBI was responsible. Uh, I don't actually re recall whether any ATF personnel remained there, but uh, the FBI was responsible. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. When you testified before this committee a couple of days ago, you had talked about a 
the questions that you had asked uh, Mr. Rodriguez. Could you again tell us what those questions were? Okay, as I said, you know, the, the whole event was a traumatic event. Dur during this time, my conversation with Robert, I, I took notes. And the reason I took notes is earlier that morning I had met with all the SRT team leaders and they had three or four specific questions. Was that a part of the plan as you all were developing um, the plan? To? Uh, if, in fact, somebody came out to let you know what was going on in there, was that part of the plan? Yes, that was, that was part of the plan. And, and who, at, who helped you develop that part of the plan? That, that he would as go in that day, question. I think it was just a consensus. Like I said, when we developed this plan, there was not one person. There was 15 people right. that participated, and we just talked things out and you know, came to the conclusion that he'd have to go in that day and give us a report after. And when, you know, like I said, when, when he reported to me, the words that he spoke this, this morning, he said, Chuck, they know. And I asked him again, what do you mean, you know, they know? And then he went through, I got a telephone call. He went in the other room, he, he came back and said ATF and, and the guard are coming. And I go, what do you mean, he, you know, what, what, what's he doing? And he repeated that again, that he got a telephone call, came back, said ATF. And so I'm thinking, what's, what's going on? You know, so I asked him trying to determine if Karish was doing something or was he just saying this as he had said before. So I said, is he telling anybody to do anything? And he said, no, he's not telling anybody to do anything. So then. I, I said, you know, is there any guns out? He said, no, there's any, any guns out. So I went through a series of questions, and then I went back to the team leaders, which repeated a lot, lot of the questions. But I just determined, I don't think there is a disagreement on the words that Robert has said to me. It's just the interpretation of what those meant to me versus what they meant to him. Mr. Rodriguez, let me ask you some questions then. Since how long had you been um, talking with Mr. Koresh? I entered the, uh, the compound approximately eight times. First time was on January the 28th, then on the 17th, the 18th, the 19th, the uh, 21st, uh, 26th, I mean, sorry, 27th and the 28th. It, it, at any of these times, did you, all, did you ever go back to Mr. Sirvan and talk to him about your conversations with Mr. Koresh? I mean, was there any reason to believe that he should understand the personality changes here? Ma'am, that, that was one of the problems that I admit that we had in our undercover operation. We did have, we had obtained a lot of information, or I had, but the communication was, was just not there. The only time that I did com communicate was with Mr. Wanowski, was on a, was on a Saturday, okay. uh, when uh, he had, I had uh, been in the compound that Saturday, which was the 20, 27th. And uh, I was in there supposed to uh, find out what the reaction was to the first issue of the, of the uh, sinful Messiah. When I came out, myself and another agent met with Mr. Wanowski. And I advised him, there's so much that I need, that I need to tell you to keep from, from uh, uh, rambling. What is it? that you want to know that would prevent this raid from, from being stopped. He said, Robert, he said, if there is a, a guard in front of the gate with a rifle, that's no problem. We'll take him down. If you see somebody with a gun inside, that's OK. We, we, we come upon that all the time doing our work. But if you see somebody with a rifle on the tower, then we'll call it off and do it some other time. At that point, I knew that that's, that those were the main issues. Uh, regarding Did we see a, anybody on the tower with a rifle? No, at that particular time, there was, I saw no firearms. I saw nobody preparing themselves. And one thing that uh, when I left, Chris was not reading the Bible, I do not know where Mr. Serban picked that up. Uh, everything was, uh, as I left, the people were there standing uh, in, in the living room area when I left. And that's, that's the way it was. Thank you. Yes, yes you, may, you may respond uh, if it's a follow-up to her question. One question that you asked as far as the planning and the coordination between the, the undercover and the planners. The first day we went to Fort Hood, 
all the planners reported there before all the agents came in, the SRT team, and this was this committee of 15 to 20. Well, we brought Robert up, which he briefed all the team leaders. We went over the, the, the plan, they asked him questions, and in fact, on his information, several teams modified their plan that day. Uh, Bill Buford's New Orleans team had asked him about some stairs and a couple other things. So, you know, we had, as long as we wanted, maybe I could ask him questions or whatever, what he thought, how, how we should do it. And we made changes as a result of that input on the first day at Fort Hood. Okay. And I would yield back then. Thank you, Ms. Thurman. We've each, uh, each side has used It'd be I'm against have our about time. seven and a half more minutes, and, and, and then I will yield to you, Mr. Taylor, and to Mr. <clears throat> We've each used five minutes of the time, so there's 15 minutes to a side left at this point. I'm going to yield myself uh, such time as I may consume of that remaining time. I want to run, first of all, over to Mr. Rodriguez a second to follow up on a couple of quick questions. At any time when you were in the Mount Carmel compound, did you smell or see or observe uh, any evidence of a, an active methamphetamine lab or other evidence that would suggest drugs existed at the Branch Davidian compound? No, sir, I didn't. Mr. Rodriguez, is it true, as some have asserted uh, in some of the reading I've had, that their plan that David Koresh had worked out with you was an arrangement that you would move into the compound about March 1st if this raid had not occurred February 28th? That's correct. But that was not something that you ever planned to carry out, I gather? No, sir. Okay. I did not. Nobody had ever talked to you about going ahead and doing that if the date, suppose the date of this raid had been later, would you have done it? What I had told him was, be sure the raid's on the first, because I am not going back. Okay, fair enough. All right. Uh, I got a question for you with regard to uh, Bible studies and so forth and religion. Had you been, there's some evidence that's been presented to us that you had not particularly had a strong background before you took this undercover task in the, in the Bible or in the book of revelations and that you got most of your information on the job training so to speak is that correct i'll tell you i'll tell you how i did that sir uh prior to the uh undercover operation uh i was uh thinking that in, in the case that that i did go in see mr aguilera had showed me all the all the information he had on what they believed in and uh i did not want to go unprepared just in case it happened that I, that I went inside the compound. So what I did prior to uh, my entry in the compound, uh, I called my Catholic priest and asked him, what is the book of Revelations and the book of the seven seals? And he, and he explained to me uh, very, very shortly, I mean, uh, uh, I understand. What, what it was. That's fine. I want to just get that and on that, the record. That's the, only, that's the only part that... That's and all that's, you, that's, that's, right, you that's had not had any background in it before then. That's all I wanted to get. <laughs> uh, Mr. Ballesteros, I want to ask you one quick question, Agent Ballesteros. Uh, there has been some writings out there that have said something contrary to something I think you said earlier today, and that was supposedly that you made a couple of statements to the Texas Rangers that the ATF shot first and, uh, and did not announce. Now, that's not what you said today, but those statements have been made in print. Uh, am I correct that you are denouncing those statements is not true? The statement that I made that was in print was that I'd assumed that the gunfire that I heard was coming from our dog team. In trial, I testified that that was not the case. Uh, certainly could not have been the case because as we exited the trailers, I heard gunfire. I was running with the dog team. Um, I didn't see any dogs. We didn't see any dogs. And uh, like I said before, the gunfire had already been coming from the compound. So that was obviously a poor assumption on my part because clearly the fact is, the facts are, that gunfire emanated from the compound. Mr. Chernowski, a couple of quick questions to you. Um, is it true, uh, uh, well, let me ask it this way. Why was the film uh, never developed uh, that we understood from, I think, Mr. Merletti last week uh, that was taken in the undercover house uh, was not developed? And why were not the videos reviewed uh, before the raid? The only way I can answer that is to say that I didn't know that the film hadn't been developed. We had people assigned to accept the, the raw film and ensure that it was immediately processed so it could be reviewed when the, uh, primarily so the planners would have access to it when they were working on the plan. I was not aware of those facts until after the investigation when we found that there was film undeveloped. Now, Mr. Marletti also commented on uh, Chuck Serebin's conversation with him and that we had had a phone call during the course of the Treasury review. Uh, Chuck called me that evening and advised me that he was in the, in the middle of the review 
and that they were putting an awful lot of pressure on him to come up with a story that supported the position that, that I knew the, the raid had already been compromised. Uh, Chuck said they had uh, told him that his family name would be soiled in America, that his wife and children would be embarrassed to be called Sarabin. And Chuck said, I just felt so bad about that. I told him, tell me whatever the truth is that you want to hear and, and, I'll, and I'll say it. And I said, Chuck, you have to do whatever you want to do. It's, it's your statement, but just tell me one thing. Is it the truth? And he said, no, it isn't. I said, thank you. And then he went back and retracted that statement. Mr. <coughs> Chernosky, yes, uh, is it true what we heard Mr. Higgins say last week that a decision was made uh, on or about the 12th of February at a meeting? I gather that you, maybe Mr. Hartnett, and Ms. Serban were participants in. I'm not sure who all was there. Um, not to go forward with the idea of arresting Mr. Koresh outside the compound, but rather to concentrate strictly on going in and having the search and, uh, and the dynamic entry. That's what uh, the director indicated to us Friday. Do you, is that unfamiliar to you? You're looking a little puzzled. I, I'm sorry, I am a little bit puzzled. We, when we went to, uh, to headquarters with our plan, the plan that we brought forward in writing was the plan uh, for the dynamic entry. We had discussed those other options. Now, it's certainly possible that during the course of the conversation with Mr. Higgins, that we pointed out the other options that we had decided against, and I believe he possibly certified uh, our position, don't do those things. I do agree with the dynamic well, entry Well, essentially, uh, at some point a week or 10 days or two weeks out from the raid, you had made the decision not to attempt to arrest Koresh, even if he'd come out of the compound. Is that not true? We felt at that time that if we arrested him outside the compound, we still had to bear the brunt of attempting to execute the search warrant inside that location because that's where the evidence was. I understand the reasoning. I just want to know the fact that you'd made that decision at a week or 10 days or two weeks, sometime in that time frame before the raid. You had decided to discard the option of arresting him outside the compound, even if you had seen him outside the compound. I, I would have to say we probably did. We didn't expect to see him. We said he wasn't I know that, out. but if you had seen him, you'd already made up in your mind you weren't going to do that. That's what I'm getting at. That's correct. We had no way to do that at that time. All right. Why, uh, question for you as well, why didn't you listen, if, if you heard it from her, maybe you didn't hear it from her, but Joyce Sparks advised us that she told you her opinion that you should not go forward with this raid and that if you uh, captured Koresh outside the compound, uh, it would have cut the head off, so to speak, and that under their religious tenets, uh, the way that uh, he was making himself out as a messiah, they would never have killed themselves because they all had to die together. That's what she said Friday. And did she discuss that with you, those two points? Did she object to it? And why would you choose not to listen to her on that point? I've never met Ms. Sparks prior to going to Waco for the raid, uh, so we have never had that kind of conversation. She may have had it with ATF people, I can't deny that. But uh, up until the time I went to, the, to establish the command post, I, All right. I, Let me ask I, this, I may not have met her even there. Mr. I don't Sarab, know her. Mr. Sarabin, do you know of anybody who talked to Ms. Sparks about this, to whom she spoke that? Uh, well, I think most of her con conversations were with Davy Aguilera. And, right. you know, but she, she didn't say it to you? No. All right. Were there no telephones carried out at the raid site, Mr. Chernosky, uh, that were there? In other words, we had a report that Mr. Lynch, the deputy uh, who got the 911 call from Wayne Martin after the raid began, could not get through to anybody at the raid party for 20 minutes because there were no telephones, portable phones, and no way for him to do that. Uh, he was a deputy sheriff there who got the 911 call. My understanding of that situation is that we in the command post had the phones tied up. We presumed that the sheriff's department was maintaining constant radio contact with their headquarters. They had a radio set up in our command post. The radio was on and they were monitoring transmissions back and forth. I don't know whether that radio was on or not on at that particular point in time. Well, uh, you did have radios with you, but you didn't have telephones. In the command post, we had both radios and telephones. All right. Why, uh, why wasn't a no-knock search warrant sought? Normally, uh, no-knock search warrants are, are for those kinds of situations that relate primarily to uh, narcotics where the evidence can be immediately destroyed in our situation. It could be destroyed, but not in an, in an immediate uh, did, time frame. Did agents Daryl Dyer and William Crone set out to draft a raid plan uh, that was never actually formally drafted? And uh, is it true that it was in Crone's desk at the time of the raid, the rough draft, the physical draft? The plan, the document that those two men were attempting to prepare 
was an administrative plan for the conduct of a national regional response. It was not the RAID plan. There are two distinctly different documents. The RAID plan is a tactical document prepared by the leader of the RAID, normally the, the leader of your SRT if you're having an SRT call out. And in this case, they were all in Fort Hood fine-tuning what their teams were going to do and were, they had written plans but it was handwritten. Those handwritten documents were to be collated into one formal under an ATF raid plan form document when they came to the command post on that Sunday, the 28th, when we, when we were executing the warrant on the, 20, on the 1st of March. When we bumped right, the plan I, up, they never came to the command post. But you so didn't, all right, I just wanted to find out about it. Last question, Ms. Wheeler, uh, isn't it true that there was a film crew on site at the time of the raid hired by the ATF, not related to any of the outside media? Didn't they film this, somebody y'all employed? The National Guard came in, and I was not involved with that. All that right. was tactical. Okay, I'll reserve the balance of the time, Ms. Thurman. Um, at this point, I would yield two minutes to Mr. Taylor. <laughs> Mr. Rodriguez, some people who have been openly hostile to the law enforcement community in these hearings and in statements prior to these hearings have said repeatedly that if they just waited a little longer, that the Koresh had gotten word of the raid. If they just waited a little longer, everything would have been just fine. David Koresh, being a nice, rational guy, would have just walked out. How does that contrast with the statement that he made to you on the day of the raid that neither the ATF nor the National Guard will ever get me? They got me once, and they'll never get me again. Is it your opinion that David Koresh would have voluntarily walked out at some other time? Had those words that you heard gotten to these gentlemen and they delayed the raid? David had already gone through the court system once. Uh, you have to understand that he did not believe in the court system. He did not believe in the government and his policies. The only thing that he believed in was the Bible. Uh, therefore, he would not have come out and said, well, here I am. Take me and, and we'll see what happens. He wouldn't have done that because that just wasn't his belief. He, he denounced the, the government many times, uh, denounced the NRA, called it a, as corrupt as our government. Uh, he, he, that's the way he was. The only thing that uh, he listened to was the Bible. And those were his exact words. You, in a Almost, pretty close. Mr. Rodriguez, in a previous statement, you said Koresh used the Bible. Would a more accurate description be that he misused the Bible, that he, he picked and chose those phrases that he wanted to justify what he wanted to do? Yes, sir, and I'll give you an example on, on, the, sec on the second seal. And uh, hold and behold, came in, uh, 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 a man in a red horse, and on his hand, he, uh, he had a sword. When he explained that to me, he said, right here, Robert, right here, that sword is a rifle. This is what gives me the right to bear the rifle. Not the government, not the Constitution. It's this right here. That, that sword in his hand is the rifle. So, okay. Thank you, Mr. give an opportunity, um, Mr. Brewster, for two minutes. Mr. Milady, I was kind of surprised a moment ago when the question was asked uh, about the hearings and uh, the testimony thereof that uh, you held up the blue book and said everything I've heard in here was in the blue book. Uh, as one who feels I've learned quite a bit out of the hearings, uh, there's several things that I've heard that I don't think are in there. Maybe I've overlooked them. I can't find anywhere in there that said, m mentioned that Mr. Hoynoski is being sued for over $2 billion by different people involved and that he has some lawsuits against others. I don't find where it uh, has that Joyce Sparks advised ATF personnel that uh, the raid shouldn't be done. In fact, I don't even find where Mr. Rodriguez, uh, as he testified early, is stated in there as having a feeling that suicides were inevitable. Are those, in fact, in there? Sir, the um, part about Mr. Warnowski being sued, that may have happened after the report came out. I'm not, I'm not sure of that. But So it's <coughs> true then about, that... There's nothing about lawsuits in the book. Uh, the part about um, uh, refresh memory, what were the other two 
that Ms. Sparks uh, testified that she advised ATF not to uh, do the raid nor the raid at the end. And also, that Mr. Rodriguez testified today he had a feeling that suicides were inevitable after talking to Mr. Crash. And I'm just the point that I think I've learned quite a bit out of this is not in the book. And you testified the, the, that everything was in the book. The part about the suicides is brought out when Mr. Buford interviews Mark Burrow. And but Mr. Rodriguez today, the guy who had talked with Koresh on numerous times, uh, I don't find that anywhere in the book. Never, nevertheless, my, my point is, I think we've had a lot of good testimony that most of us didn't know. Maybe you did, but it's certainly not in the book. A couple of things, uh, Mr. Ballesteros, Mr. Williams, were you uh, involved in the training at Fort Hood by the Army? Either of you? Yes, we were. Yes, we were. Both of you were? Yes. Was the element of surprise mentioned there, uh, the, the fact that they wouldn't know you were coming? Was that part of the plan? Part of the plan was the, uh, the cattle trucks due to the fact that that's a rural area and cattle trucks are seen all around and driving up in that would uh, bring up no suspicion as to when we're coming. If we were driving a uh, did, standard... Did you know then when you went to the door, when you started to the door, that he knew you were coming and could be, could have an ambush set for you? Yes, we knew when we went through the door that he knew it was coming, yes. You both knew that he, that he knew you were coming and an ambush was possible? We didn't know about the ambush, but we knew he knew it was coming. But you did know he was a violent sort of guy? Yes. And give it two minutes to Miss Slaughter from New York. A lot has been made of um, the fact that an outside group wanted to go down to Texas and x-ray those guns to make sure they'd really been altered. Now, you're the FBI gun expert. What do you know about x-raying guns? Well, in my particular opinion, that would uh, x-raying the guns can certainly be done. It would be a waste of time. The Is that a normal procedure to x-ray guns? No, ma'am. How did you determine that guns had been altered? I examined each one of the firearms that was submitted uh, to the laboratory, and as I mentioned uh, this morning, it was 297 firearms in various states uh, or various conditions. And of those that I determined were fully automatic, I looked at each one of the firearms and noted uh, by observation under the microscope the parts that were necessary to make those firearms fire in the full automatic mode. Uh, how many did you locate that we had been uh, had been converted? There were 48 that had been modified out of the 297. And one question I want to ask you, Mr. Williams, if I could follow up. I, did you say that you did know when you started on the raid that Koresh knew you were coming? Yes, from the information we had at the uh, staging area when we was told that they know we know we're coming. That he knew you were coming? Yes. Right, because my understanding was that I, what, what I heard, Mr. Sarabin did not really believe Mr. Uh, Rodriguez when he said that. As I understand Mr. Rodriguez's testimony, he said that, that he was nervous. You had said, what is he wearing, and then hung up the phone. Is that basically it? Well, I asked a series of, uh, of questions, but it was clear in, in my mind, I thought that he did not know that we were coming at that time. None that he had said those words, I repeated those words, but that I thought we could safely execute the warrant. So you did notify the men in, who were going to the I passed on the words Koresh. that Robert told to me to all the commanders, to everybody in, this, in the staging area. And Mr. Rodriguez, I, I, my understanding from what you had said and, and what I have come to believe myself is that suicide was inevitable because they wanted to die. Is that not correct? Their prophecy would not come true unless they died. In my opinion. In, in fire and explosion, as I understand it. In my opinion, yes, ma'am. Is it your belief that they set the fire? Well, there was evidence that, that they did did you have any indication while, while you were there uh, on that morning or, or, or had you heard anything at all in your conversations with David Koresh that in the event that someone should come that they would set a fire from inside that compound? Well, uh, all, I, all I did uh, during that time was just uh, refer to the sixth seal and that would tell you what was going to happen. I'm, I'm not uh, familiar with that, I'm afraid. <laughs> okay. The, the, you know, if you go into the, to the sixth seal, it describes uh, the final destruction of, of the earth with the earthquake and uh, uh, people dying, people being swallowed up. That is, is, is what you would call the final, 
my time now Thank and um, yield to Mr. Schumer. Okay, I guess I have uh, seven and a half minutes. I yield uh, one minute to Mr. Taylor. Just, just very quickly, Mr. Rodriguez. Yes, sir. Again, when Koresh said neither the ATF or the National Guard will ever get me, it, that's obviously very strong words, obviously had a very strong effect on you. Did that statement somehow get conveyed to the gentleman on the other end of the table who made the decision to proceed? Mr. Taylor, I very clearly and very emotionally advised him that, the, that he knew that the ATF and the National Guard were coming. I, I understand, sir, but it's one thing to know, for example, that someone is coming to arrest me. Get the message that, hey, they know they're coming. It's another thing, they know they're coming, and he has said they will never take me. Did that second part of the message get conveyed to the people farther up yes, the decision-making process? He said he would, you got the message across that he said he would never be taken alive. Not like that, no, sir. Just, what did you get just across, that, sir? Uh, uh, he said that National Guard, were, uh, ATF and National Guard were coming. They got me once, and they never get me again. You relayed that message. Yes, thank you, thank you, Mr. Schumer. One minute to uh, uh, Ms. Thurman. Who generously given the rest of our time away. Um, I'm just curious because in my opening statements I've talked about that I think the other half of these hearings is what has now happened to change the way we do business. In your or in the blue book as we've talked about there have been several areas that were looked at. No meaningful contingency plan, command and control flaws, uh, general command structure, uh, those kinds of things. And I want to ask those that are on the line every day. Have you seen Mr. Buford, Mr. Rodriguez, Mr. I'll get it wrong, Mr. Williams and Mr. Rod Can you tell me in your duties today, have you seen these particular questions being addressed in the agency so that in fact this country will never have to go through this again? As for me, uh, I have no, uh, I don't have too much contact with headquarters. Uh, I'm, I know there's some things uh, that are trying to be changed. Whether they are or not, I really can't tell you because it hasn't been funneled down to, to, uh, to the agents. Thank you. Uh, two minutes to uh, Ms. Jackson Lee. Thank you very much, Mr. Schumann. Thank you for uh, the time being yielded. Uh, Mr. Williams, uh, it seems that there was some questioning of you earlier um, that either attempted to place blame, and I'm trying to clarify, uh, as you were moving toward the door of the compound, you were following orders, is, is that not correct? That's true. Did you have in your possession the search warrant? No. But you were at that time following orders? Yes. And you were at the point um, of moving toward that door under someone's instructions that we were now beginning the raid, is that my understanding? Yes. Uh, and all review of details, if they had to be reviewed, some superior had reviewed them. Whether you were involved in the review inside that trailer or whether you were in the trailer, you had to move forward because someone said, move forward. That's correct. Uh, Mr. Rodriguez, um, you got a crash course, I understand, in uh, the teachings of Mr. Koresh. Yes, ma'am. Uh, we keep trying to isolate or try to understand this sect or this uh, group. I don't want to denigrate them, but I do know that many read the Bible and understand that render under Caesar what is his, and so that religions can have respect for government. Uh, but you went inside there uh, to create an atmosphere in order to make it safer. Were you in there to cause a disturbance, or were you sent in there so that some information could come out to help this raid work without loss of life? What my do you main, think you were in there for? My main objective was to obtain as much intelligence as possible. And this intelligence, of course, was going to be used to uh, make this raid a success and, and safe. And so when you learned all these biblical things that you didn't know anything about, it was to gain confidence from this individual and to provide that intelligence out to your superiors so it could work in a safe manner. Yes, ma'am. And you did give the information about finding out about um, uh, that he knew about it to your superiors? Yes, I did. Thank you, Mr. Schumer. 
We reserve, we reserve uh, the rest of our time, three and a half minutes. All right, I'm, I'm going to uh, do similarly. We have, I think, six minutes. I know we have six minutes left over here. I'm going to yield three of those six minutes, divided one minute to Mr. Shabbat and two minutes to Mr. Micah. Mr. Shabbat, you're recognized for one minute. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, at the end of October of last year, you fired Mr. Sarabin and Mr. Wanoski. You said they lied. You said that Mr. Sarabin made false statements in the course of a criminal investigation. You said that they had altered documents. And you said that no penalty short of firing would be sufficient. But then, as you've also testified, you turned around just two months later and rehired them with back pay and even paid their attorney's fees. Now, maybe I'm wrong in this assumption, but I just cannot believe that the ATF would rehire people it truly believed had obstructed an investigation by lying and altering documents. I just can't believe that you would hire anyone, any such person, for any position at the ATF without being forced to. So that seems to leave one of two explanations for the rehiring. Either the Treasury report that lays the blame on Sarabin and Wanewski is faulty, or someone was trying to buy their silence by rehiring them. Mr. Black, which was it? I'd have to say it's neither. We're not, we are not questioning we never questioned the motives of either Mr. Sarabin or Mr. Nowski. We believe they made a good faith effort to carry out their duties. We believe they were doing what they thought we expected. However, having said that, we faulted their judgment. We faulted their supervisory judgment for going ahead with that raid. I think as you've also heard today, there's conflicting testimony. They make a compelling case, so the agents make a compelling case. We have a minute and a half left to give to Mr. Micah, and I need him to ask his question. Mr. Micah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hart, did you, in fact, go to Mr. Ron Noble, who was uh, undersecretary for law enforcement after Wenaki and Sarabin had been fired, and say that it, it was your view that, he, that if he did not rehire these agents, their truthful story and the fact that it had been covered up would eventually become public? No, sir, I never did. I haven't seen Mr. Noble since two you, years. you never went to Mr. Noble and asked him about this? No, did sir. Did you ask him to rehire these individuals? No, I did not. Mr. Black, Mr. Black, you signed the settlement agreements to rehire Sarabin and Winoski. Winoski, is that correct? That's correct. Did Mr. Noble participate in negotiating the agreements? As far as I know, Mr. Noble did not participate. I believe that lawyers may have discussed it with him, but he did not participate. Was Mr. Noble also in charge of the Treasury report that turned out to be the reason they were fired that everyone's referred to? I think that's fair to say, yes. Mr. Black, I'm now providing you with a description of Mr. Wanaki's new job, which requires him to, and I quote, this is part of the job description provided me, serve as an expert witness to present evidence and facts in civil or criminal trial hearings. Does it make sense to you to put someone you just fired for lying into a job where one of the major duties is testifying for the government in court? I believe that in a role that he was in, he would be testifying as a non-agent. He would be giving advice as far as uh, dealing with the U.S. Customs Service. Mr. Thank you. I have to do that to keep three minutes of our time over here. I yield uh, to uh, whoever has Mr. Schumer for the balance of your time, then we'll close with three minutes. Thank you, and let me just say, I think this morning's testimony, uh, I think a number of things have come out pretty clearly. First is, of course, that Koresh fired first, that's indisputed. Second, that the element of surprise was broken, that's indisputed. Third, that the decision to go ahead once the element of surprise was broken was almost certainly the wrong decision, that's the overwhelming consensus here. And then we get into the debate as to who made the decision to go ahead. Uh, the report says that Mr. Uh, Hoynotsky and Mr. Sarabin made the decision knowing full well that the element of surprise was broken. That's an error in their judgment. Uh, Mr. Uh, Sarabin and Mr. Hoynotsky basically say that they weren't clear, or certainly Mr. Sarabin says he wasn't clear that the element of surprise was broken at that point in time. Finally, and I think this is a very salient point, the only people on the panel who criticize the Treasury report are the people who are singled out for criticism in the report. In particular, uh, Mr. Sarabin, Mr. Hoynotsky, and Mr. Hartnett. 
that otherwise, the and even they agree with the most of the report, they simply disagree with the parts of the report where they are singled out for criticism. And I think that speaks fairly well of the report. But Mr. Hartnett has issued a very serious charge here, and that is that the report was a cover-up. He said two things. First, he said, and he said that, quote, um, that the element of surprise was important. He had never given an order to the field commanders that if it's, it was lost, they should abort the raid. I would wonder why he didn't, if it was a bad thing to do. Criticizing everyone else, he had the ability to say, or certainly advise the head of ATF, don't give them the okay unless surprise is not broken. But second, I'd like to ask you, Mr. Merletti, since you put together the report, was there a cover-up of the report? Just answer that yes or no. Absolutely not. So what do you think of Hartnett, Mr. Hartnett's charges that there was a cover-up? I think they're baseless. And why do you think he's doing it? I believe Mr. Hartnett, in his heart, feels he, he was doing the right thing after the raid. In, in basically, what ended up happening is Mr. Sereman and Wanoski now blamed the undercover agent, Mr. Rodriguez, who was the hero. Right. They blamed him. Yeah, I think it's clear from today's testimony, Mr. Rodriguez, that you and Ms. Mr. Ballesteros and Mr. Williams are the heroes, and at the very least, Mr. Sarabin changed his story a bunch of times. And I believe that ATF was being criticized quite a bit by the media because the line agents were coming out saying the element of surprise was lost. Management was saying it was not lost. I Mr. Believe Buford is also a hero, and I'm yeah, sorry for not <clears throat> mentioning that. But I believe that Mr. Hartnett, call it a conscious avoidance of the truth, wanted to defend his agency. And he didn't talk to the line agents. He relied on Sarah and Wynoski. And they kept telling him the story that Robert didn't... He, they actually said Robert didn't even tell them that the... ATF and National Guard were coming. I believe that's how it all began. Mr. Hartnett, as the supervisor down there, whether he lied or whether it was a conscious avoidance of the truth, only he knows. But he chose to side with the, the supervisors. With Sarabin and Mr. Sarabin and at, Mr. Hoynatsky. Yes, and I believe he was trying to do the best he could to bolster the image but of again, ATF. Again, to repeat, is there any iota of cover-up in this report? Absolutely not. Go back now. Mr. Chairman, could I ask unanimous consent to, uh, with, without objection, enter uh, a? Uh, <laughs> I know what well, you're going to ask, John. Go ahead. I know. I sent it down to you in advance, sir. Uh, but Albert Alshuler of the University of Chicago has a. Uh, an interesting commentary on the affidavit and the search warrant, and I ask unanimous consent that it be used. Without uh, objection, I have a comment. And I thank you very much. You're welcome. I yield, uh, of the three minutes I have remaining, I yield one minute of that to Mr. Boyer. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I just have a couple of very quick questions. One, uh, Mr. Serb and Mr. Rodinowski. Um, I was concerned when I read the AT or, or the Treasury report um, about that both of you had uh, not only dis you disclosed not only ATF's intent to take action against the compound, but also, also the anticipated date of that action to the, to the uh, Tribune Herald. Is that true? In my meetings with the Herald, the, the meeting was held when we were planning to execute the warrant prior on February the 24th. I was being questioned as to when that was going to take place. Our, our rate would be... Is the Treasury report accurate that you disclosed that, that the ATF was going to move against the compound? Is that true from both you gentlemen? The yes, date that yes, I gave that yes no, was the dodge. It turned out that we had to alter the plan, and we inadvertently altered the plan to accommodate or come close to that date. It wasn't an attempt to give them the information. It was an attempt to not give them the information. Mr. Boyer, your time yeah. is up. I hate to say that. Uh, it it is. I know it is, but true. I've got two minutes to close at this point. I'm going to close by asking three different witnesses three different questions. I'd like you to each to respond in the time after I finished asking the questions of all three, otherwise we won't get these asked. Mr. Rodriguez, 
I'd like to know if my understanding is correct that you would testify that there was a written raid plan prepared before the raid day, that the plan was altered, and if, it, if that's true, I'd like to, to know how you came to learn the plan was altered and if you're aware who altered it. Now, I'm going to ask that, but hold on to your answer. I want to ask a question of Mr. Wanoski about the helicopters as to why you were on board a helicopter that day, the final day of the raid. Were those helicopters any one of the three armed with weapons, and if so, with what weapons? And were any shots fired from the helicopters? Okay? And Mr. Hartnett, I want to give you a chance to respond to Mr. Merletti, uh, his last comments that he just made. And if you want to follow up with an answer, it was asked earlier about the cameraman that was disturbing you so much, you never got it all out, you'll be allowed to have the last word. But I'm going to go in that order. Mr. Rodriguez, about the plan. Do you know if there was a written raid plan and whether that plan was altered before the raid and, and then, if it was, how you came to learn about it? No, sir. I, I knew nothing about the raid plan. All right. That answers that very quickly. Mr. Wisnowski? To the best of my knowledge, the ATF personnel on those helicopters would have been armed with their 9mm sidearm. To the best of my knowledge, not a single shot was fired from those helicopters. I was on that helicopter using it as a command and control platform on previous uh, large-scale raids. We had sent commanders up to view the, the initial stages of the raid and then to quickly come back to the command post to continue on with the regular course of business. And in this case, particularly a bad move, I understand. Mr. Hartnett, would you care to respond to Mr. Merletti or comment on the cameraman question? You may. First on the review itself, I wouldn't say it if I didn't truly believe there are omissions, distortions, and false statements in there. I can provide this committee with a list of them. I'd appreciate it if you would. I will. The, the report is written in such a way that if you're one of the five managers, anything that's negative, your name is mentioned. If it's positive things you did, you're referred to as supervisors. They take half statements like, the thing about blaming Rodriguez, I was down there a month and a half. Everybody I spoke to had nothing but praise for him. He did a tremendous job. And when I read the review, it's this implication that somehow we're saying, because we believe Sarabin didn't know he lost the element of surprise or whatever term you want to use, that that means he's not telling the truth. And that's just not a fact. Both of these men did everything they could I don't believe either one of them were lying, and I'm not going to stand up here and say that I think one of them was lying or not. Treasury would like to see that when we were down there at Waco. I told them from the beginning there were conflicting statements right on up the line two and three times a day, but that has nothing to do with whether they're lying. Now, as far as what I wanted to say about the cameramen, uh, there are a lot of people in the field who felt this needed to be said for a long time. In recent years, when law enforcement goes on raids around this country, there is more and more media. There's a competition. They all want to be there. They all want to get the first story. They want to be on the news at 10 o'clock or read about themselves in the paper. Well, that's dangerous. Not a shot would have been fired. Not a person would have been injured or would a person died in that raid if that cameraman hadn't told them that we were coming. One only has to look at Oklahoma City and you'll see an FBI SWAT team executing a search warrant on a house, and there's the camera team following them along. They're in their pocket. It's another Waco waiting to happen. 20 years ago, I never ran into a news team when I went on a raid. Now every time you go out there, they're crawling all over you. Waco's gonna happen again, and if the media can't regulate itself, then this body needs to regulate them. We've got to prevent those kind of things from happening. Why should Sarabin and Hanowski and Rodriguez have to even make that decision? Have to weigh whether Korish knew we were coming or didn't know we were coming. If the cameraman hadn't told them, they wouldn't even have to made that decision. That raid would have gone down without anybody being hurt, and we'd have had those guns away from them. That's all I have to say, sir. Well, thank you, Mr. Hart, and I want to thank the entire panel. You have certainly endured a great deal from us over the past few hours, some of you over several sessions of these hearings. We have been uh, indebted to you for both that and, of course, uh, for those of you at the front line, regardless of whether or not there is fault assessed in this process uh, for the service that you've given to your country. Uh, we respect that fact, and I think that, again, it is indeed uh, our obligation to say thank you for that. Some of you have given more than service. You've given a lot of body parts at times to these things, and we are indeed grateful for that 
that fact and, and understand it. Uh, I want to dismiss this panel now and go on and introduce the next one. But again, thank you for coming today. As this panel clears, I have uh, the second panel to introduce, but they're not in the room, so we will wait just a moment to, for that to occur. Mr. Shabbat in the interim. Uh, documents 22, 23, 24, and 25 are included in the record, the ones I referred to. The ones you referred to in your questioning, uh, without objection, you've seen those will be included in the record. This Joint House Subcommittee hearing on the Waco investigation will continue in just a moment. First, some program information. Later this morning on C-SPAN's Washington Journal, the newspaper roundtable guests will be two congressmen. Republican David McIntosh of Indiana and Democrat David Skaggs of Colorado.